Welcome, I'm Harald Sack. And I am Mahsa Wafoyi. And this is Knowledge Graphs, le lecture number six, Intelligent Applications with Knowledge Graphs and Deep Learning. Today in the excursion, excursion number eight, we are talking about distributional semantics and language models. So, what we are going to do first is we ask ourselves how can we represent natural language text in the computer. For sake of simplicity, we are simply focusing on the question how to represent words of a language in the computer. Well, one simple traditional solution for that would be to represent words as unique integers that are associated with these words. For example, if we have a vocabulary that consists of these five words, we can assign number one to the word movie, number two to the word hotel, number three to the word of apple, and so on and so forth. But this solution is not exactly a computer science way of doing it, since we love to encode things in computer science. Uh, an equivalent solution that is a bit more um, complicated would be to do one hot encoding and represent all of these words in a vector. And this vector only consists of ones and zeros. The index of the word in the vocabulary will be represented with a one and the rest of the vector will be filled with zeros. And in such a way we will have movie which uh, is represented by a vector that has one as the first um, value and zeros in the rest, hotel that has one uh, as the second value and zeros in the rest and so on and so forth. So this is the most basic representation of any textual unit and when you put all these word vectors together you will have a vector space. And this vector space will event eventually constitute an orthogonal base. And what does that mean? When you have an orthogonal base, there is no similarity that is considered in your vector space. So if you take the dot product of any single word vector, the transpose the dot product of the single word vector with any other word, the result will be zero. And this um, vector space is also a normalized one. It means there is no weights here. So the dot product of any vector, word vector, with its, trans, um, with, um, its own, it will be one. And of course this causes trouble and problems. However, this kind of vector space model with one-hot encoding for a long time was the basis for many of the search engine and information retrieval engines you might know, because if you want to represent a word based on these word vectors, you would have then a collection of vectors representing a document. And then, of course, between these collection of vectors, you could find similarity rather easily. However, as you already said, Massa, between the single words, there is no similarity given, so no relation to semantics on the other hand. So, for example, we have car and we have automobile, and both of them would have different, which means orthogonal vectors. So they are rather related with each other, but we can't see that in that model. On the other hand, also, all words are equidistant, so no matter which vector I subtract from any other vector, it's always the same distance. And of course, this is not true, because if we look at the words, of course, some are more similar to others than others. So this is problem number one. Problem number two goes the other way around. So if you have a word, like for example, Jaguar the cat, it has exactly the same vector as Jaguar the car, because you don't distinguish their different entities, you only have the word. And polysemy here, for example, is an issue, and these two things cannot be covered. That is absolutely correct. So in order to make the um, vectors, the word vectors, a little bit more context dependent and, let, and a little bit more semantic, we can also use some handcrafted features and relations in the representation of these words. Some potential features, for example, would be morphological features such as prefixes and suffixes. And with the help of these morphological features, we can at least see that words that belong to the same syntactic category are closer together. Or we could use stems and lemmas and put words that are semantically closer, also closer together in the vector space. Or we could use grammatical features directly, like the part of speech, like the gender, number, or structural features, such as capitalization, to put nouns closer together, proper nouns in particular, hyphen, or digits. 
some other potential relations that could be used in order to make a representation of words that takes into account the semantics of them is our synonymy, antonymy, hyper or hyponymy, and so on and so forth. Okay, however, a problem remains. Um, we have to annotate the stuff, and annotation requires high manual effort, and of course, Several annotators might have a different opinion of how to annotate that. On the other hand, this is of course closely related then again with accuracy and if you have a huge corpus that has to be annotated, scalability of course is an effort. So what to do? The question is now how can we in a better way, let's say automatically, compute the meaning of a word or represent the meaning of a word. You might remember this semiotic triangle from the very first week of the lecture. We had, again, the same problem. So we had the symbols here that stand for specific objects which they represent. On the other hand, these symbols, they symbolize a concept upon which sender and receiver of a message, so the participants in the communication act, must agree. So this is one way, for example, to say, okay, we would have to connect each symbol somehow to a physical object. Can we really do that? That's quite difficult, since uh, the computer usually can't see and can't interact with the world. So this is a typically, let's say, human interpretation of the world. Well, that reminds me very much of a famous quotation by the German philosopher of the 20th century, Ludwig Wittgenstein, who says, the meaning of a word is its use in the language. Maybe this helps in the representation problem? Of course, it does. So just think of it. So let's define words now by their usage. So how do we do that? So in particular what we are doing is we are trying to define words by their environments. Environments, what other words are used together with the words we want to describe. And this idea of course is not new, it's already in the 1950s. Selig as Harris said, if words A and B have almost identical environments, we say that they are synonyms. Thereby, and this is the logical consequence, semantic representation for words can be derived through an analysis of patterns of lexical co-occurrence in large language corpora, which means we simply try to find out what's the environment of a word, and thereby by different environments of different words we can compare them the more similar the environments are, the more similar are the words. And that again reminds me of another famous quotation by another, this time British linguist, J.R. Firth, also from the 20th century, who says, you shall know a word by the company it keeps. Okay, so let's see how this works in general. Probably every student of linguistics, of computer linguistics, know how to generate text based on n-grams. So one gram is one word, two gram is two words, three gram is three words, and so on and so on. And if you simply compute the probability of co-occurrence of words from a large corpus and you note down exactly these probabilities, how often does a word occur if another word comes in front of it? How often does a word occur if two other words come in front of it? And you extend this chain of words, ev words even longer. The better you capture them um, by, of course, this paradigm of distributional semantics, the meaning of the word. If we do that, we do this now with n-grams. First with 1-grams, which means we only look at the probability that a word occurs in a corpus, which means that should be gibberish. Then we take 2-grams, so we take a word, what's most likely, what's the other word that follows. Then we take 3-gram and 4-grams, and let's see what happens. So. One gram Shakespeare generator, which means we have taken the Shakespeare corpus of his place and then see what happens if we try to generate always, given a word, what's the next most likely word. In a one gram scenario, this is completely random. So you see here it says, to him swallowed, confess here both, which of, safe, on, and so on. So this is simply a sequence of words that doesn't make sense. What follows are two grams. So there I have one word and then I ask, so, I give this word, so the first word that we take here is y, and then what's the most likely word according to the corpus that comes next? And then you have dost, why dost? Then you look at dost, what's the most likely word that comes next? Next, then you have stand, and then something 
um, is created like why dost stand forth thy canopy forsooth he is the palpable hit the king henry also this doesn't make sense but it sounds already quite nice we continue three grams so we take two words and then see what happens next so fly and will rid me these news of price therefore the sadness of parting as they say tis done this shall forbid it should be and so on sounds even better doesn't make sense at all but now the magic happens at four grams so you see here i will go seek the traitor gloucester ex eun some of the watch a great banquet served in it cannot be but so that Pretty probably good. sounds plausible doesn't it so the magic happens here this is almost shakespeare and of course uh, the story goes this is of course shakespeare because you are looking at four grams here so statistically is this kind of a shakespeare text but there is no let's say um kind of intelligence involved in that however this is distributional semantics and nowadays distributional semantics of course goes way further and way beyond that so as we are recording these videos in March 2023, of course, we had to try this out with ChatGPT. And it's very interesting to see that ChatGPT adds in the flavor of drama. And we have a dialogue between two Shakespearean characters uh, that is created by ChatGPT. Um, Pook, wherefore art thou here on this island? I am but a messenger, Caliban, sent by the fairy queen to bring magic and mischief to this place. And what manner of magic do you bring? Oh, uh, all sorts. But wait, let's not get carried away by drama as much <laughs> as we love to. And back to the topic of distributional semantics. So, um, as a reminder, J.R. Firth in the 20th century says that um, we shall know a word by the company it keeps, and that's where we switched to Shakespeare. So to go back there, let's have an experiment and see if Firth's um, claim can be proved. Now let's take the word Ang Choi as an example, and this is particularly interesting for those of you who do not speak any Asian languages. Suppose you don't know the word Ang Choi and you see the following sentences. Ang Choi is delicious, sauteed with garlic. Ang Choi is superb over rice. Ang Choi leaves with salty sauces. What do you think Ang Choi is? So you have seen sentences like these before, that spinach salted with garlic over rice, chard stems and leaves are delicious, colored greens and other salty leafy greens. So your world knowledge and the fact that you have seen words and um, sentences like the green sentences before directs you toward the idea that ang choy is probably also a leafy green like spinach, chard or colored greens. And when you look this word up, you can see that yes, you were totally right. This is ang choy, which is in simple words, water spinach. Great, so we know everything about water spinach. So that's distributional semantics. A word's meaning is given by the words that frequently appear close by. This means when a word W here appears in a text, so we have a word W here in a text, its context is the set of words that appears nearby within a fixed size window. You remember the one gram, two gram, three gram, so we have a window of a specific fixed size. And then we use the different contexts of W to build up a representation of the word. So take for example here the word capybara. If we want to explain what a capybara is, we should look to the left and to the right. So here we have two sentences. Through quiet agile on land, or though quiet agile on land, capybaras are equally home in the water. Nice, isn't it? A giant, cavy rodent native to South America. The capybara actually is the largest living rodent, which gives us a pretty good idea what the capybara is. And of course, this already characterizes exactly that kind of bird. Okay, so um, in order to encode a word into a vector in such a way that it also keeps its similarity with other words, we can build a dense vector for each word. And you can see an example of such a dense vector for capybara. So here we are not 
um, only using zeros and ones, but we are using weights and we are creating a vector in such a way that we can um, actually compare this word with other words and make sense of the relation between these words to one another. So word vectors, also called word embeddings and word representations, are a distributed representation. And when put together, word vectors can create a vector space. And in a vector space, we combine distributional semantics, or basically the statistical language model, with the vector intuition, so that we can see how close or how far different words are from one another. And in this vector space, of course, similarly sem um, semantically similar words are closer together, and the different words are further apart from one another. And this is called an embedding because it is because all the words are embedded into a vector space. And word embeddings are nowadays the standard way to represent meaning in natural language processing. The first popular framework for learning word vectors was word to vec Probably you have heard already about that by Mikolov in 2013. Its operating principle is quite simple. So we need to have a large corpus of text and then for every word in a fixed vocabulary, this is then represented by a vector. And we go through each position t in the text, which has a center word c and a context, which is the outside words o. And then we use the similarity of the word vectors for c and o to calculate the probability of o given c or vice versa. And then we keep adjusting the word vectors to maximize this probability. So this is the way how exactly these word vectors are computed. If you are interested in the details, of course, look into the reference. Just to give you a simple glimpse of the process here, we have the center word, capybara, and then we are looking at windows here. For example, this is a window of size 3 in one direction, window of size 3 in the other direction, and then we are looking at the probabilities here. What's the probability, you know, given the word here t minus 3, which means these three words, that word t, capybara here at the center occurs. Then we look at the two word probability here, W T minus 3, what's the probability that after on land capybaras occurs and so on. So we are looking simply at these um, probabilities, uh, these conditional probabilities here. And that then, if we have computed all of them, we move our window by one farther to the right. And then we do the same thing like we did for capybara, we do for R and so on and so on. And this we do for a large text corpus and then we are simply adapting according to the probabilities that we compute here our word vectors to increase similarity between really similar words. That's the intention behind. Okay, so word to vec tries to maximize the objective function by putting similar words nearby in the vector space. And in doing so, it also adjusts the word vectors and uh, creates the vector space. And there are two model variants presented in the 2013 word to vec paper. The first one is the skip gram model and the second one is the continuous bag of words. In the skip gram model, the goal is to predict the context words given the center word. And in the continuous bag of words, it's the other way around. The goal is to predict the center word from the context words. OK, now what's the benefit of this kind of word vectors? What you can do is, of course, you can evaluate these word ve vectors by intrinsic evaluations. And one of them is so-called word vector analogies. You want to see, given a word A, how this, of course, relates to word B. This should be the same relation or compute the same relation of the word C to D. And we want to compute exactly what would be this word d. And you can do this simply here in the in the word to vec model. And practically speaking, this means if you have the word man and the word woman, what is the other word that we are looking here for if we have king in the center? And you see then in the vector space, man and woman are connected by a specific vector. And if we then simply add this vector here to king, we might end up at something. And it's pretty likely that if our model, of course, uh, is mapping semantic similarities correctly, that this would end up somewhere near queen. So this is a nice way to evaluate your work, uh, word vectors. You do this simply then uh, via a distance that you compute, for example, via the cosine distance. And um, this is a nice way also to draw then inference and conclusions. However, you might have a problem in the sense if the space, the vector space you are computing here is not purely linear or the information you are looking for is not 
reachable, let's say, in a, a linear argument, then of course um, we have to resort to other kind of models that are a bit more complex than this model. Okay, so far so good. This was word embeddings for natural language text. Of course, we want to now transfer this principle of distributional semantics also to graphs and especially to knowledge graphs. And then we come to knowledge graph embeddings, which is the subject of our next lecture.